So let's talk about the role of Spain in Europe before the discovery of the New World. Spain was a powerful country. As you recall, the kingdoms of Aragon and Castile had just been united recently to form the new kingdom of Spain. And they had the blessing of the Pope in reconquering the Muslim kingdom of Granada in southern Spain from the Moors. Also, the Inquisition, which is to say the, uh, the attempt to enforce religious conformity against Jews as well as remaining Muslims, had the blessing of the church. Uh, Torquemada, the head inquisitor, was well regarded in the Catholic Church. Um, so, because of this standing of Spain, the nation, the kingdom had been awarded by the Pope the title, the official title of Defender of the Catholic Faith. And as part of this status, if you look at this map here, you'd think anybody could have simply gone if they had the ships from Europe and taken a part of this new world that had been discovered. In order to prevent that, the Spanish and the Portuguese, in part because if they hadn't tried to settle for a treaty, they might have gone to war over which of them gets to have how much of the new world, got the Pope to sign on to a document with the force of international law that awarded all of the world outside of Europe to Spain up to this line here from the southern tip of Greenland down to the bottom of the world, everything to the west of this line to Manila in the Philippines was supposed to be Spain's to discover, exploit, and uh, conquer. Everything on the other end of this line, Africa and Asia all the way to the Philippines, was going to be for the Portuguese to bring into the fold of the Christian faith through exploration, exploitation, and conquest. And the Pope was in a position to make international law because that was his role in Europe when everybody was Catholic. And this excludes obviously the Byzantine Empire, which was Russian or rather Greek Orthodox, not Catholic. Um, but everybody who was Catholic, all the kings and, and princes of Europe accepted the Pope as the highest moral authority and therefore if two rulers had a dispute over land or the line of succession, like which son gets to inherit the crown or whether maybe a daughter gets to inherit the crown, the Pope had the final word. He basically functioned like the United Nations. But this role of the Pope as the ultimate arbiter of international law rested on the unity and moral authority of the Catholic Church. So it's a twofold whammy to Spain that both its power in the, in the New World as well as in Europe rests on a link to the Catholic Church. What if anything were to happen to the Church or to the faith that it represents? And this is precisely how things played out in the 1500s. The Catholic Church lost some of its moral authority and the faith the Catholic faith came under fire from the Protestant Reformation. One obvious reason is that clearly the Pope was playing favorites by giving the rest of the world outside of Europe to the Spanish and the Portuguese, to the exclusion of everybody else. So the British and the French, who were, well, the French in particular, who were quite powerful, were not okay with it. Um, but even short of that, the discovery of the new world created a credibility issue for the church. The church, the Pope is supposed to be all knowing. What they say is the final word on everything, theology as well as everything in the world. So why then had, did the church not have any idea that there was a whole nother continent out there? That is one thing. The other thing that might seem strange to us today 
is that geography played such a, an important role in the way that people thought about faith and revelation. Jerusalem was not just any old place in the world. If you go back to the map that showed the world in this, on a circular map, Jerusalem is essentially smack in the middle. And of course, all three great monotheistic religions that believe that there is one God and only one God who created the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all consider Jerusalem to be the spiritual center of the universe. And on the old map, minus the Americas, Jerusalem was smack in the middle, right where it belongs. Now the map has to be redrawn. The globe is round. There is no geographical center and Jerusalem becomes unmoored and through that the faith becomes shaken. So all these things together made possible the Protestant Reformation. What really kicked off Martin Luther's criticism of the church, however, was the secular, the worldly entanglement of the Pope in Rome, rather than being the highest moral authority based on the Pope and the Catholic Church being the custodians of the true faith, they were far too interested in worldly power and wealth. One way that the Spanish maintained influence on the Pope was by, simply put, bribing the cardinals, and the cardinals of the church are, of course, the ones that elect a new pope when the old one dies. So these elections were paid by the Spanish. That's why the pope played favorites. The wealth that accumulated in the pockets of popes and cardinals who set church policy in Rome changed the way that these ministers thought uh, of their role in the world they became highly interested in luxurious living and building nice palaces for themselves. This is the time where St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome is being built, that marvelous structure that is the heart of Catholic um, Christianity. But it is being built with Spanish gold and Spanish bribes. Nevertheless, the money that the Spanish send is never quite enough for the church and its officials. They're always on the lookout for more money, for more funds to raise. And one way they do that is by launching a campaign for selling indulgences. An indulgence is where the Pope, who in Catholic doctrine is the, uh, the substitute, the stand-in for God in this world, can give somebody time out of purgatory, purgatory. Purgatory in the Catholic faith is where the soul goes after death before being judged and saved on judgment day at the end of days. Purgatory is sort of like hell, but it's temporary. The amount of time that the soul spends in it, and if you don't, if you don't spend time until the judgment day in purgatory, the soul goes to limbo, which is neither hell nor heaven. It's kind of just a waiting room. But purgatory is like hell, and the soul spends as much time in there as is justified by the sins the person committed in their lifetime. So the indulgences say you get so and so many years cut off your sentence in purgatory. The church sells these on pre-printed forms where you pay a certain amount of money and then you get a specific time out of purgatory. It is professionalized to the point where the most prolific salesman in Germany, Mr. Tetze, goes around with, a, with an advertising jingle. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. This practice to sell grace, to sell deliverance from purgatory is what Martin Luther, a Catholic monk who worked out of Wittenberg in central Germany, found contradictory to the true meaning 
of scripture. The problem was, of course, that scripture was in Latin and some even more obscure ancient languages. As a monk, Luther was able to read these languages, but the common people, the faithful, to the extent that they were able to read, and that wasn't true of many, were not able to read the Bible. They had to rely on the word of the priests to interpret and explain it to them. So Luther figured that if people were able to read the Bible on their own time, they would be closer to the truth, to the will of God, than if the priests explained it to them. This, however, was heretical. By Catholic dogma, you can't alter the word of God, and a translation is an alteration. Um, the word of God, the literal truth, that the word itself carries holiness with it, likewise creates issues with printing. What about the type used to print the a Bible, for instance, even if you haven't translated it? Uh, some people today might make fun of or, or you know, have lack understanding of the importance that the, the text of the Quran, the book itself, has for Muslims. Why it is such a scandal when, for instance, American troops burned a big um, stock of Quran in, in Afghanistan a few years ago, and why that leads to, to protest. But this is, of course, not alien to the Christian tradition either. Um, so the question is, is the lead that was used to make the print, the type rather, that was used to print the Bible, that, that, that had formed the word of God at one point, can that lead be used again for other purposes? What if you melt it down and make cannonballs from it or shot? Um, wouldn't that be blasphemy? Wouldn't you be killing people with the word of God in, in clear defiance of the commandment, thou shalt not kill? So some of these theological issues that are involved with Luther's project of bringing the faithful closer to God and bringing the church back to the true path of God were, um, were not completely nonsensical, but important questions to ask. Luther figured that he was not the first to criticize the church for corruption, in other words, for becoming too enamored with worldly power and wealth. There had been others before him. Some had been cast out as heretics and were burned at the stake. Others, however, were um, sainted, or even in their lifetime were given important roles in the church. It always depended on who the Pope was at the time and how open he was to reforming the church and, and how open he was to accepting criticism. One important is example from the Middle Ages for a critic who, like Luther, said, why does a priest, why does a bishop, why does the Pope need to live a lavish lifestyle when Jesus, who should be our model in how we conduct ourselves as Christians, but especially as men of the cloth, lived in poverty and shared everything he possessed. He had no possessions. He, um, he practiced a primitive communism with his followers. Why is it then that these bishops think it is okay to, to um, drink expensive wine out of uh, crystal glasses and so forth? So one predecessor along this line of thought had been St. Francis of Assisi. He was the son of a rich merchant out of the North Italian town of Assisi, who, um, who moved out of his family's house, moved into a poor neighborhood of the city and started preaching to the poor, to the sick, even to the pigeons and rats, a creature so lowly that nobody would even think of them as creatures of God. But Francis wanted to make a point in saying, yes, of course, they are as important as the king and as the pope in that they are creatures of God too. Same for the poor. And rather than cast him out as a heretic, the Pope at the time uh, was sensible and uh, shared some of the criticism and appointed Francis to head its, his own order of monks, devoted to spreading Francis's message further. 
and that is how you get the Franciscan friars. If you look at the present Pope, Francis, of course, after this guy, um, his first act as Pope was to go into a prison in Rome and to wash the feet of the prisoners. This in an affirmation of that same tradition that Luther invoked to say that as Christians and as priests, we have to follow the example of Jesus and we have to, um, to embrace even the poorest and most outcast and most downtrodden in society if we are to be in accordance with what God wants. But so much was at stake that Luther had no chance in getting through to the Catholic Church. And what was at stake was not just the wealth that many in the church clearly enjoyed, but it was also the power associated with that wealth. And the power was the power of the, uh, the Habsburg state. Now the Habsburgs are the family that governs Spain. And not just Spain, but as I said before, they also own the Netherlands, which is the wealthiest industrial area, proto-industrial area of Europe at the time. They govern Austria, that is their ancestral homeland. And as archdukes of Austria, they have been serving as emperors of Germany since the late Middle Ages. So, in fact, Charles, King of Spain, is at the same time Charles, Emperor of Germany, and he rules um, almost all of Central Europe, either directly or through intermediaries as German Emperor, and he rules Spain. And by virtue of ruling Spain, he rules America and the Philippines, and then some. So he is the first one to say, the sun never sets on my realm, because literally somewhere in the world where the sun is presently shining is always going to be owned by him and governed by him. And the power in the world of this king is intimately linked with the claim to truth and power of the Pope in Rome. As emperor of Germany, he is not just called that, he is called the Holy Roman Emperor of the German nation. So the Roman, the link to the Roman Church is built into the constitutional setup of the German system. And for a German monk to rock the boat and to say, maybe the source of your power, the Catholic faith, the power of the Pope, is not valid at all in the eyes of God, that is an attack that the King of Spain slash Emperor of Germany cannot let stand. So Luther is, um, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Luther is, is told to come to the city of Worms in the Rhineland, where the Imperial Parliament of Germany, also known as the Diet, is in session. And that's how we get that phrase of the Diet of Worms, uh, because the Diet met in that city. Um, has nothing to do with the fear factor and eating bugs. But um, Luther was called to renounce his criticism in front of the officials of the empire and the delegates of the Pope and the emperor himself. But with the words, uh, here I stand, I cannot help it. He refused to do so. He might have burned at the stake for that. Certainly they were already gathering the wood. But what happened at that point was that the smaller German princes who were technically under the authority of the emperor and who had long wanted a more autonomous role than they already enjoyed, decided that Luther's theories were good for them because they finally provided them with a strong theological argument to use in their secular power struggle with the emperor in Germany. If you want more authority for your own kingdom that is part of Germany and therefore under the authority of the emperor, you're in a much better position if you can say, and God is also on my side and not on the side of the emperor. So various princes sided with Luther, protested against 
the Pope and the Emperor at this Diet of Worms. And henceforth came to be known as Protestants. And they spirited Luther away, protected by their own armies, to a castle in central Germany where he was kept safe at a secret, undisclosed location to keep working on his translation of the Bible and on fleshing out uh, the, the items of faith that would come to be known as Protestantism. Beyond Germany, <clears throat> the impact of the Reformation and of Protestantism uh, was greatest in England. Here, initially, you had a dynasty, the Tudors, represented by King Henry VIII in the 1530s, who were very much on the side of Spain and the Catholic Church. Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon, who was the daughter of Francis, uh, excuse me, of Ferdinand and Isabella, the first king and queen of Spain. So, um, in spite of the fact that the English, with their own exploration, you remember Henry Cabot finding Newfoundland, um, were also looking at the New World, nonetheless were not at odds with the Spanish. That changed when Henry VIII wanted a divorce from his wife, the Spanish princess. The reason for this was that she had borne him one daughter, Mary, but no further children, and especially no son. Now, divorce is, of course, outlawed um, in Christianity, by and large, because in the Bible it says, what God has joined, let no man rent asunder. And God joins people in marriage as a sacrament. But the Pope is no ordinary man. He is God's stand-in in in the world. So as a matter of course, the Pope can dissolve marriages. He can grant divorces. And when that comes to kings and queens, essentially he rubber stamps these requests. If a king says, this woman can't get me an heir to the throne, she can't bear a son to become my successor, the Pope signs the paperwork and says, fine, your, your, your marriage is clearly null and void because if God wanted you to be together, he would have already given you plenty of children. In the case of Henry's request for divorce, however, the Pope refuses. He refuses because the Spanish pressure him to do so. Remember, the Pope is in the pocket of the Spanish. So at this point, Henry VIII develops a keen interest in Protestantism, telling his advisors, and he was not interested in religion before that at all, telling his his advisors that You know, if there is this monk out there who's saying you don't have to listen to the Pope, uh, I want to know more about it because I don't want to listen to the Pope either. And as a result of that, you get the Church of England, which is a Catholic church under the authority of the King of England, or rather the Archbishop of Canterbury, a position created specifically to become the substitute Pope for the Church of England. Um, So Anglicanism takes its origin here. At the beginning, the point of having your own church of England is simply that the Archbishop of Canterbury can sign the paperwork for the divorce. Um, And so that's what he does. The history of Henry VIII after that is rather sordid. You might have heard that he goes through a number of wives and beheads, not personally, but has beheaded, two of them. The irony is that he never becomes father to a son. There's one more daughter, Elizabeth, and that's that. And this Elizabeth, unlike her father, grows up a fervent Protestant. She is a religious woman, and religion to her is not just an excuse for power politics. She reads Luther, she reads the Bible, she studies the arguments of theology that underlie the Reformation, and she wants to make England the leading Protestant power. She wants to be the defender of the Protestant faith to go up against Catholic Spain, the defender of the Catholic faith. And since England is already, by becoming Protestant, challenging Spain's ideological 
supremacy. It also needs to go and challenge the source of Spain's power by establishing English colonies in the New World. Conveniently, that also comes with the mission to save the savages from the benighted papism of the Catholics, to bring the true light of Protestantism to the Native Americans. So Elizabeth, shown here in a famous photograph, um, has great ambitions for England, and she rules the country for a long, long time, 45 years, in which she can uh, build on that ambition. And what you see in this picture here <clears throat> is programmatic. First of all, she is decked out in all kinds of bling. Pardon my French. Um, the, the pearls she's wearing here, that is um, one pearl would signify that somebody is filthy rich. You might have heard about the painting, the Dutch master of the girl with a pearl earring, which was made into a movie uh, or a movie based on that with Scarlett Johansson. You can tell, we don't know anything about this historical girl who is shown in that old painting, except because she wears a single pearl as an earring, you can tell she must have been very wealthy, or at least she must have had wealthy friends. Elizabeth is not wearing one pearl, she is wearing um, more pearls that you can possibly count. And pearls were, at the time, what diamonds might be today. And even diamonds are not as, as valuable today as pearls would have been at this time. So she's wearing on her body multiple times the worth of the land in all of England. And that's without even co considering the cloth, which is brocade and silk and what, uh, all other kinds of very rare and expensive material. And then there's the crown with rubies and um, emeralds and whatnot. So what is the message here? Not that your queen is filthy rich and you aren't, but rather she re represents the nation of England. What she shows here then is that she has led England to, to wealth and prosperity by pursuing a program of what? Of world domination. See, she has her hand on the globe on the part of the globe that shows America. So she's calling dibs on that. And because she do does that, she has to go up against the Spanish. And that is what is shown um, in the pictures in the background here. The glorious British fleet sailing out and beating the Spanish Armada in the year 1588 in a cataclysmic battle that ended Spanish world domination as far as the Europeans go. I mean, even at this point, the Spanish fleet probably couldn't have gone up against the Ottomans or the Chinese, but within the European uh, realm, the Spanish were dominant, and then they lost that and had to rebuild from scratch. Um, and without a fleet, you can't really hold together a world empire and dominate it and defend it against competitors out of Europe. So this is the program of Elizabeth, and because we are talking about the history of the United States, which begins with English settlement in Virginia and in Massachusetts, around the Bay of Massachusetts, what happens in England is important. Meanwhile, on the other side of Europe, the conflict that had set off this European quest to find another way to get to India has continued all the way since 1453. By 1529, the Turks, the Ottomans, lay siege to Vienna. And meanwhile, we have, we have talked a little more about the point of Vienna. Vienna is the Austrian center of the Habsburg dynasty. So it's the, the capital of Germany and the seat of the Holy Roman Empire uh, of the German nation, governed, of course, by the same people who are in charge in Spain, by the same exact guy. This happens in 1529, and it is not an accident that it happens 12 years 
after Luther sets off the Protestant Reformation and a few years after Luther was forced but refused to uh, renounce his criticism of the church in Worms. The Ottomans read the European newspapers too. They see that the Christians are fighting amongst each other. So what better time than this to try and uh, conquer other pieces of land inside of Europe. As a result of the handling of Luther by the emperor, when the emperor goes and asks the German princes for help, when he says, the Muslims are at the gates of Vienna, I need your help to defend my city, they basically tell him to go, uh, and you can't probably, you can't say that in a recorded lecture, but they say, say in no uncertain terms that um, they have, they have greater sympathies for the Muslims than they have for him because of the way he, um, he treated Luther and them, the German princes. So the Austrians have to cast a wider net. And fortunately for them, they have gold because they're also the Spanish to pay for mercenaries. One of the people who sign up as a mercenary to work on the Balkans and help the Austrians fend off the Turks is a guy named John Smith. Um, and being a mercenary, a man for hire, that has been his, uh, his career. He's very good at that. He also has um, what, what we might today call intercultural competence. That is to say, when he fights against people who don't share his language, who don't share his culture, who have a different religious belief system, he has the the, the brain structure, the intelligence to adopt to that, to think like they think, because if you want to fight somebody, you need to understand how they tick. And when he is therefore captured by the Turks, um, he gets out of that pickle. He manages to talk his way out of it. Later on, he writes a book about that, telling about his adventures among the wild Turks. And he says that the reason he got let go is because the daughter of the Ottoman general had a thing for him and pleaded with her father to let him go. And that's how that went. And if you've heard at all about Pocahontas, then you've heard that story before. And the reason it's the same story is because it's the same guy telling the story. Only now, a few years later, he is being sent to Jamestown a colony in North America that is falling apart because it is very undisciplined and people are mostly into making money, not so much into growing food and building shelter for survival, and who have also managed to alienate the Powhatan nation of Native Americans that live close by. And, and John Smith is sent there to make peace and to build the settlement to a place where it can be defended. Um, and of course, in this case, uh, he is no longer on the side of the Habsburgs, of the Catholic power, but he is fighting for the English. Um, so here we have suddenly arrived in Virginia and the moment in time where, that you probably know, the story of Pocahontas and John Smith, that we know through his, through his telling of the tale, he says his life was saved when he was captured by the Powhatan because the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, intervened on his behalf to let him go. Uh, that's the same exact trope that you had in his telling of his life's story on the Balkans. But it's not an event that sits loose in time, that it, but it's connected to the story that we've been treating so far and to the long development um, of European interaction with the Muslim world, as well as ways within Europe that people fought over how, uh, who gets what share of the new world. 